Good morning. Let's get started with this session. Um, my name is Regina Hawk. I'm the president of the International Association of Cryospheric Sciences, IAX, and I want to introduce our speaker, Walid Abdaladi. He's from the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences of the Universe Series of the University of Boulder. Before, among other positions, he was the NASA chief scientist in 2011 to 2012. His research um, focuses on the understanding of the changes in the Earth's ice cover, especially using remote sensing, but also in situ measurements and observation, um, uh, observations and modeling. Um, in addition, he's an excellent communicator, um, having the ability to, to convey comse complex con uh, concepts um, in simple ways, understandable ways, not only to scientific audiences, but also to policymakers and lay audiences. And that's for all these reasons, we are very happy that he, he accepted the invitation um, by IAX to uh, deliver the IAX Union Lecture. So we're very happy to have him, have him here and very excited to um, listen to his talk. So, how do I advance the slides? Gr oh, green button. That's a little, thank you. Okay, so thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. I, um, you know, I've had the good fortune of being in a field that has really evolved in leaps and bounds through the advent of remote sensing observations and. Yeah, my, my background uh, was initially in engineering and aerospace engineering in particular, and somewhere along the line I got far more interested in what satellites were seeing as opposed to the actual engineering behind them. Um, so that's what I've been doing the last 25 years. And I'm going to talk about the value or what perspective, the space-based perspective, has revealed to us uh, from satellites. Um, so from the beginning of humankind, I think we've always sought higher ground, always tried to go up and look down, to survey landscapes, whether it was for hunting, whether it was for defense, you know, being removed and seeing threats approach us. Um, humans have always sought a perspective from higher and higher up. Um, this is the first aerial photograph taken in 1858 of Paris. And again, you can imagine, you know, those of you above a certain age, the first time you saw Google Maps and thought, wow, it's cool. I can see, you know, my house, my neighborhood, and you get further and further out. Well, you can imagine um, Paris, Boston, the view from above, and how that changed the way people looked at their homes, looked at the places they lived. Uh, I don't know, is there volume with this? Oh, you got to hear the volume because this is narrated in 1960s. All right. Well, this I'll I'll talk you through it. This is the uh, launch of the Tyro satellite. Uh, as I said, it was the 60s. I think you can tell from this animation. Um, but the whole idea behind uh, this video was to highlight the. Oh, I got to hang on. They refer to this as a flying lady's hat box. Um, but the, the whole purpose of this video is simply to say we're entering a new era in space ex or in Earth observation and understanding. Um, by going out into space in 1960 and watching weather phenomena, watching clouds, we could understand the world and these processes in ways that were um, foreign to us. Uh, I'm going to advance. Can I skip past this one, please? Okay, so one of the things I wanted to highlight, you saw those lovely graphics, is prior to that, we didn't know what the world looked like from up there. Yeah, we knew there were rivers and continental outlines and Great Lakes and probably clouds and these sorts of things, but this was our perspective on the Earth at the time. Um, the space race continued uh, primarily for geopolitical, well, political purposes, um, and uh, I, I won't say culminated, but well, yes, uh, with the landing on the moon uh, 50 years ago this month. And one of the critical aspects, you know, this is what got the huge U.S. government investment in NASA was the race to the moon. The launch of Sputnik 
scared the United States to death. The successful orbiting of the Sputnik satellite really, it's been referred to as the sound that forever changed the world. Um, so NASA invested tons, or the United States invested tons and tons of money into getting people to the moon, but really what came out of that, and this gets to the, the title of the talk, The Power of Perspective, was uh, William Anders. We came all this way to explore the moon, and the most important thing is that we discovered the Earth. This Earthrise shot is Life Magazine's most influential photograph of all time. Um, I like to think it was the French guy's picture of Paris from 1858 uh, up until then, and I'm sure he did too. But um, this really changed the way we looked at our own world. And this isn't a new concept. Um, it dates back, uh, even um, Socrates, 400 BC, had said, man must rise above the earth to the top of the atmosphere and beyond, for only thus will he fully understand the world in which he lives. The perspective from above, the perspective from on high, and the higher the better to a point, eventually you get too far away, is really of tremendous value in helping us understand the world we live in. And so there had been, beyond Tyros, a concerted effort to build a series of satellites to observe and understand the Earth's system, um, most notably for the period 1964 to 1978, multi-sensor capabilities on the Nimbus satellite series that allowed us to look at things like um, ozone, allowed us to look at ice cover, allowed us to look at land masses, but primarily atmospheric, oceanic, and uh, cryospheric phenomenon over this 15-year uh, period of the Nimbus satellite series. Um, one of the first obvious returns was, you recall the image I had shown previously of what we thought the Earth looked like at the launch of Tyros. Well, now we could watch hurricanes. We could watch them unfold. We could see the eye. We could see the cloud bands. We could see their movements, relate them to other phenomena, and get a, a much better understanding of the mechanisms and processes by which hurricanes act. Um, Another, uh, if you went back and looked at that slide, you'd saw something called a coastal zone color scanner, looking at phytoplankton, chlorophyll in the ocean. We combine that with uh, spectral measurements of vegetation on land, and we get the Earth's biosphere. We get the chlorophyll and um, the nor through the normalized difference uh, vegetation index, uh, vegetation on land for biosphere carbon uptake, biospheric processes, and related phenomena. One of the things I'll spend more time talking about this is the ability to monitor sea ice cover and sea ice concentration. Um, another huge one, uh, the um, ultraviolet uh, sensor on Nimbus 4 and the ozone mapping sensor on Nimbus 7 allowed us to track ozone, the detection of the ozone hole, one of the sort of most obvious, and I would argue uh, a great success story um, in Earth observation, enabled by the space-based observations, changing the way we live, changing decisions we make, changing how we progress moving forward. Earth radiation budget, again, the, just the continuity of observations, the global long-wave radiation, uh, made possible by these satellite observations. Um, the Landsat series allows us to track changes in land cover over time, and one of those um, results that I find particularly fascinating is the greening of the Arctic. Um, it's over a relatively short period compared to the Landsat record, but nonetheless, we're watching the evolution of our Earth in many ways. And so, over time, um, this is the NASA Earth observing system. It would be a lot more crowded if I added all the other international components. But we've developed capabilities to look at the world as a whole, as a system, in many different ways. And one of those areas that's benefited tremendously has been the cryosphere, and in particular sea ice. And this is a list of the different tools we have for observing sea ice cover and its changes. Um, but in the simplest sense, watching, watching sea ice, watching its behavior, watching it shrink in the summer and grow in the winter in the northern hemisphere, 
the degree to which that's changing, the movement of the ice, has helped us understand how one of the least observed aspects of the Earth's system until the advent of these capabilities is evolving, has evolved with time. And I think everybody in this room is familiar, if you're not, newsflash, the Arctic sea ice is shrinking. Um, <laughs> but the, the trend in Arctic sea ice cover, and you can see the very low year in 2012, which I'll talk about in a minute, but the behavior since 1978 of Arctic sea ice cover, a diminished ice cover. Um, this is the record, um, what you see is the 1981 to 2000 mean in the black line, the standard deviation, plus or minus two standard deviations in the gray. 2012 was this minimum year. Um, and overlaid on top of that is 2019, what it's doing this year. And actually, I made this graph uh, a couple days ago from the site at the National Snow and Ice Data Center. And I updated it this morning. And I know there are ice watchers. You know, what's it doing now? Is it lower? Is it higher? What's it going to do? Excuse me. Well, we are now at a point where we are below the minimum uh, year uh, at this time of year for that season, uh, excuse me, for the ice cover. So what it's going to do going forward, I don't know yet. I have some guesses. But the point is we're able to track this, look at this in the context of a, of a temporal history that really is of tremendous value to understanding what is going on. Um, we can also use the emission characteristics, the microwave emission characteristics, not just to track the ice concentration and extent as shown in the figure here, but in the bottom right, the ice age. So if you look to the right is old ice, greater than four years old. To the left is young ice, a year or younger, or new ice. Um, this is 1984, not a particularly high cover year. And this is 2016, not a particularly low cover year. But you can see the change both in the spatial extent, but if you look at the graph, the change in the age of the ice. The old thick ice is disappearing. Um, similarly, the emission characteristics tell us about the, the period of melt, the melt season, which as you see from the expansion of this curve, the melt season is growing, <laughs> or is increasing in duration. Melt onset is occurring slightly earlier, um, freeze up is occurring later. Um, and when we combine the extent and the melt, uh, the other variable we're able to look at is thickness derived from satellite altimetry, uh, ISAT, ISAT-2, Cryosat-2. Um, and what you see here is the, you know, the satellite flies, we can measure freeboard height, the height of the surface of the snow and ice cover above the water, and from that infer thickness. Um, this is some work done by Ron Kwok and others. And over time, we've watched the thinning of the Arctic sea ice cover. This is just a snapshot. ISAT observations on the left and uh, Cryosat-2 observations in the right half of this curve and maps of the, of the ice cover. You can see the thinning happen right before our eyes. And for context, uh, the, vis the, the observed thicknesses are those lines uh, in different colors on the right compared to uh, longer term ice models, um, ice modeling estimates. So the observations not only allow us to watch this unfold, but enable us to validate and understand our models, where they're working, um, and effectively improve them, but ultimately build confidence. So what we have is we have a shrinking ice cover, we have a thinning ice cover, and it's getting younger. And my apologies to those who've seen me show this before, but, but thinner and younger is something I would love. But uh, <laughs> when it comes to ice cover, it's just a bad thing. You don't want it. I'm, I'm just going to look at that picture for a while. Uh, it's my face on someone else's body. Um, but more important, or not more importantly, but equally as important is, is not just watching these processes unfold, but understanding the underlying mechanisms that drive them. And when we combine the ice concentration and ice extent observations, 
with other observations such as surface wind, surface temperature, atmospheric temperature, uh, both observed and modeled, we start to understand this is the influx of a cyclone um, that ultimately melted and advected some of the, the sea ice cover away. We start to understand the role of uh, air temperature in melting, water temperature in melting, and advection in understanding the, the diminishment of this sea ice cover. Um, I talked a lot about the Arctic. The Arctic has gotten tons of attention um, because it's disappearing more rapidly than we really thought it could. While the Antarctic has been growing for a number of years, uh, this is from a paper by Claire Parkinson that just came out a couple weeks ago. Um, you can see the trend, uh, slight growth in the Antarctic ice cover, which a lot of people pointed to and said, oh, it's this climate change thing is baloney. Why doesn't anyone talk about Antarctica? Well, the scientists did talk about Antarctica, and the growth of Antarctica is an interesting, or Antarctic sea ice cover, interesting and important scientific phenomena. But something interesting happened in 2015, 2016, to the point where the ice cover is lower than we've seen it in the satellite record. Uh, I caution my colleagues that just as, you know, when we uh, criticize people for seeing abrupt increases in temperature sustained for a couple of years, and some choose to use that as an argument against the increasing tr temperature trend, the same is true for the Antarctic sea ice cover. We don't know what's happening, but what we can say is the lowest it's, it is the lowest it's been in the 40-year record. Um, moving to land ice. Oops. So a lot of my work has been done uh, in Greenland on the Greenland ice sheet and working with satellite observations. Most of you are familiar with the concept, you know, if, if we lose uh, or sea level rises by a meter, there are parts of the earth that will be affected, some far more so than others, um, but virtually no coastal region is, is immune to some effect. Um, these numbers, I don't have updates. They're from 2007, so 12 years ago. I have to believe that 944 billion is quite a bit higher now. Um, but nonetheless, huge economic impacts, huge humanitarian impacts associated with sea level rise and the tools we have to observe. We can look at elevation change, mass change, motion of the ice cover, reflectance of the ice cover, the energy absorption, iceberg calving. Um, and in the beginning, you know, when I was a graduate student and actually uh, earlier in my career, we simply had one question, are the ice sheets growing or shrinking? We didn't know, we couldn't answer that. Um, we had a set of tools developed uh, to, to target that question and I say in the beginning, there was Crable, uh, Bill Crable and the Airborne Laser Altimetry Program, the first to map elevation changes on the Greenland ice sheet, saw thinning at the margins, growth at the interior, uh, for a net mass loss. So we finally, um, in 2000, were able to answer the question about one of the ice sheets. Yes, it's shrinking, it's shrinking a little, and it was good. We had our answer. Um, Resurveys showed that that loss was increasing as time went on, and fortunately, we uh, had the development of many more, t or m several more tools to understand the ice change. Satellite altimetry, Gra gravimetry, the advent of interferometry that allowed us to look at the, the wastage at the margins, the ice loss coupled with the surface balance from models, and um, to, excuse me, together that allowed us new estimates of the ice sheet mass balance. And I, I love this phrase, a man with one watch knows what time it is, a man with two is never sure, because we now had more watches. And we ended up with a range of estimates, and I remember those meetings and the conversations where people, one in particular, was so sure he was right and everybody else was very wrong. Some of you know who that is. Um, but, but the point is, people latched on, well, my method shows this, my method shows that. Um, this was a good news 
not bad news, but it, 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 was a, it was a double edged sword. So we now had new information, we had some disagreement, and ultimately uh, the whole groups got together uh, through the IMBI, ICE Mass Balance Intercomparison Exercise, I think, um, to reconcile the, these estimates and pull them together into one, um, one agreed upon estimate. And uh, we continue to see the ice losses over time through these various methods. But one of the things I want to point out is that we've had surprises. This is old, you know, this is from 2002. But as you watch the disappearance of the Larson B ice shelf here, one surprise was how rapidly this area um, disappeared, this large large area of ice cover. But the other, I won't call it a surprise, it settled a debate was the influence of that ice loss um, on the flow rates of the glaciers. And there had been debate up until then as to whether, well, if you remove the floating ice, does that allow the ice behind it to flush out? Or does that have no effect because it's floating and it's not really exhibiting a restraining force? Well, we had the perfect experiment with a control. Um, if you look at the remnants of the Larson B, the glaciers that fed that did not speed up. The glaciers that fed the lost parts of the Larson B did speed up and sped up dramatically. Uh, so big question in glaciology because it has to do with how tightly coupled glaciological processes are to current day events as opposed to the s decadal, century, uh, millennial time lags associated with other factors that influence glaciological behavior. Similarly, um, as we saw the, the effects of moulins, these melt lakes and rivers that drain to the depths of the ice sheet and lubricate the ice bed interface, we saw real-time coupling between today's climate and ice sheet discharge rates. And I, I was involved in this study, and this wasn't done with satellites. This was GPS um, measured seasonally throughout the year. But the point here is we learned that seasonal melt caused these glaciers to speed up very, very rapidly. And it's natural to extrapolate from that. Well, more melt, more rapid flow rates. But the satellite observations, what Ian Jockin and others have done, have shown, yes, that, that seasonal characteristic flow. But it doesn't necessarily mean more melt, faster ice, you know, that it's a runaway effect that will go on a unabated with time. By continually monitoring the velocity characteristics, we're able to s infer through some other modeling, um, the hydrologic network efficiently drains itself and it's not necessarily a runaway effect. This is a huge effect and again it's a present day coupling of uh, old, old ice to, to current day phenomena having implications directly for sea level rise. Um, I do, I think I'm going to skip over uh, these in the interest of time because there's a couple things I want to hit on. Um, so one of the perspectives we get is from ocean altimetry, um, beginning with Topex Poseidon through the Jason series. Um, and we've seen sea levels rise. We've been able to see um, the fingerprints or the spatial distribution of the sea level rise. And uh, the point here is when I, I've, I've had the opportunity to speak to political figures, to the general public, to church groups, to anyone who will listen to me, so, so thank you for listening. Um, when you show something like this, lights go on. When you show ice used to be there, now it's gone, lights go on. The whole temperature thing is a little hard for some people to get their heads around. What does... What does one and a half degrees Celsius mean? In some cases, what does Celsius mean? But the, um, but, but the, the ice is binary, right? It's there, it's gone. Um, the spatial distribution of sea level rise, really a powerful tool in telling a story and helping people understand. And I want to just point to this figure. This is the GIST temperature record showing temperature rise. And, you know, people look at this and see what they want to see in it. I've spoken to a lot of people generally around 2010 who said, well, temperature hasn't gone up since 1998. 
And those, anyone with experience with numbers understands the flaw in that statement. You look in 1998, you've got a full record. Why are you zooming in on that particular period? Because it tells the story you want, right? Um, and I'll skip over that. If I come back to this, this figure, the interesting thing is if I show someone this figure, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, all of a sudden they get how numbers work. Now, admittedly, it's a log scale on the side. It's a little bit different. But um, nobody looks at that and says the Dow is done. The Dow is done rising. It's not going to have – Dow hasn't gone up since um, 2000 or 1999, right? Nobody looks at that because it's money. It's different. It doesn't mean I'm going to have to change the car I drive or stuff like that. So at the end of the day, my main message is it's often less about the data than the narrative. It really is what story do people want to see? And now as scientists, we look at data and say what's there and try and interpret it. But in the political domain, in the social domain, people kind of already have their opinions. And they look at data through a lens that's very different. And when we talk to individuals, climate skeptics uh, or, or others, it's really important to understand their narrative and have the conversation in the context of their narrative. If I learn nothing in Washington, D.C., well, one, I learned the commute's a lot shorter if you leave at 6 a.m. rather than 7 a.m. But the other thing I learned was um, Understand the narrative. If you want to have an influential conversation, understand where people are coming from. And when it comes to Earth observations from space, we have a tremendously incredible narrative. Um, people use space-based observations of Earth all the time, whether it's for defense, whether it's for economics, whether it's our day-to-day -day lives, checking weather forecasts whether it's for uh, human health, whether it's for resource exploration. This information is critical to our success as a society. And I think we have a great narrative. It's a narrative of economic opportunity. It's a narrative of exploration and discovery, reducing risks, national security. There's something for everybody. And I often got a couple of the slides I skipped over. When I was chief scientist at NASA, I would get from some people, why are we wasting all this money on this earth science research at NASA? Um, fortunately, our international partners seemed more enlightened, but, um, but it was, we should be directing this at going to the moon. We should be directing this at going to Mars. And I would argue, and actually the Space Act that founded NASA in 1958 also argued that one of the most important things, I think the most important thing NASA does and space agencies throughout the world is study our home. It's a great story. It's an important story. It's a critical story. And it's a story that must go on. Thank you.